Hello all, Eric Hoxter here from ChessDaily.net and today I want to bring forth a video, uh, the first of a series that I want to do about uh, how to find winning chess ideas uh, for the novice player. Uh, because when you get started playing chess, you know, you learn how the pieces move, you study some uh, opening theory, you study some end game, uh, you know, you, you study a tactics trainer, you go to chess.com or Lee Chess or Chess Tempo, you know, and you do all these things. But then when you start playing, it doesn't really get fun if you don't know what to do in the middle game. You know, you don't know these principles of strategy, you don't know uh, all these Steinitz principles and such, and you don't understand, you know, these motifs and tactical ideas that, you know, come about. And that's what I want to talk about today, is just how to find winning chess ideas. This is going to be a beginner video. Uh, there's also going to be one for uh, the more advanced player. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to keep it something simple. And when it comes to strategy, there's lots of things that you can learn from. Uh, and I mentioned Steinitz. A uh, video series I'd like to give a shout out to and, and link up is one by a YouTuber called Chess Diagnostic. And he did an awesome series that was called uh, Beginner to 2000, uh, something along the lines of everything you need to know uh, about chess strategy. And it's a video series and it goes really in depth into all the principles, how to assess a position. Uh, you know, how to formulate a plan, and it's kind of like what I'm going to be talking about uh, piece by piece in my video, but certainly not as in-depth. I'm not going to be talking about all the strategic principles, but just something that's simple, elementary, and practical. Okay? And I'll link that in the, I'll link uh, his video series in the comments, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I pulled this game off of Lead Chess, and White opens up with E4, D6, the Pirates Defense, Knight of 3, a little unusual. Maybe uh, King's Indian attack esque. But now they decide to play e4, e5. Uh, you know, and this is really aggressive because you're moving a pawn twice in the opening just to attack my knight, uh, or Black's knight rather. You know, and, you know, let's just really make a statement that, you know, they just want to go ahead and trade off pawns and, you know, move some pieces. So now they move their pawn twice and their knight twice. Uh, so, you know, just showing a bit of aggression. Black plays e6. Uh, looks like they just want to get the bishop up, out, get castled, uh, you know, and, and just be safe. Uh, but White decides to continue the attack. Bishop b5 check. Not really a good move. Um, because, you know, there's a saying that says it goes, you know, Patra sees a check, Patra plays a check. And this one doesn't really do anything because after c6, you know, the bishop has to move and, you know, what's going on now? You know, sure, white's close to castling and when you look at a position uh, practically and you think about these opening principles, you know, white spent two moves with the knight, two moves with the pawn, uh, two moves with the bishop, and now look at it, his bishop doesn't really have any scope, uh, his knight's in nowhere land. You know, sure he's going to get castled, sure he has more pieces out, what are their pieces doing, you know? Uh, this knight is a little bit of a bug. Uh, it's going to be tough to develop this bishop. Maybe something like b5, you know, attacking the bishop uh, for uh, black would be okay. Uh, or just something simple like, you know, bishop c5 and get castled. You know, and when these positions come about and you see white playing really aggressive, psychologically it's kind of tough to deal with, right? Because you see all these pieces coming at you and you might think their attack's stupid or you know, they're just being overly aggressive and you know, you're just like, all right, all right, all right, let me follow principles, let me go one on one, you know, get my pieces out and get castled, right? Well, yeah, but you need to take a second to breathe and really consider what's going on. Sure, you know, bishop c5 and castles is a good idea. You know, because white wants to get castled and uh, black wants to get castled and they just want to have a game. You know, but it's a little boring, so you have to really consider, you know, the quality of this piece isn't good. The quality of this piece is pretty good, but, you know, what's something that stands out? You know, we both have some developing to do, sure, but these pieces aren't defended. You know, this bishop's not doing anything, this knight's not doing anything, and just, you know, black maybe should have played. Queen d4, launching a double attack on the knight and bishop, and winning one of the pieces, and after that, you know, you, I, I think, like, when something like this appears in the game, it 
psychologically, the game becomes so much easier. It's a sigh of relief. You know, while he's playing so aggressively, and, you know, you're trying to hold the reins and, you know, make sure you don't get, uh, you know, fall off the horse and get, you know, dragged from behind, right? And now, white's losing a piece, and black just has to capture one. Then they can develop their bishop. Then they can get castled and say, okay, let's just play chess, right? And the game becomes so much easier, and then you can play simpler. You just don't have to play anything aggressive or fancy. You know, you're ahead of material. Your opponent's probably going to make more mistakes if they try to compensate with more aggression. But chances are they'll feel a little deflated. And during your games, especially over the board games, uh, if you're like 1,000 rated or 1,200 rated, you know, you'll see this every now and then. And when you get to this, you just have to pause and think, you know, what is my opponent doing wrong? And is there anything I can do to capitalize on that? And this is a rather simple tactic, you know, attacking two undefended pieces. But you have to look. My opponent moved all these pieces twice, and they're both undefended. What's going on here? What can I do? Instead of just saying, I'm going to develop my bishop and get castled. So, this really helps your game uh, on a psychological level each and every game. And uh, just taking that second to pause and really look at things helps out tremendously. Um, so, I just wanted to show something simple uh, to kind of talk about that psycho psychological factor. Um, so let's look at this game. Uh, this one, I promise, is going to be a little more complex. So I'm just going to fly through this a little bit. It's a Philidor defense. Uh, you know, some of the moves are a little odd. Uh, but again, I picked some novice games uh, to go over. And I want to look at this position here. Okay. Wayne has this nice open file for the rook. Black's Rook is kind of stopped by this bishop, who's kind of acting like a big pawn, right? Um, so, naturally, Black plays bishop c6, blocks the file, you know, stops the rook from coming in, or the queen from coming in, because this square is very tender, right? So, overall, it's a really good move. Uh, and another thing to note in this position, which is kind of outside of the scope of this video, is that White has this isolated queen pawn, and... Uh, it's really the focal point of the position, you know. White has to defend this pawn, and black has to find ways to attack it. So if white would have been happy if they were able to keep the bishop on the square, kind of blocking it from progressing forward uh, and finding ways to maneuver around and attack it. Uh, but, you know, white really uses this as a pivotal point, as a way, as a, uh, as a tool, you know, in their position. And there are many ways you can utilize an isolated queen pawn for... Uh, your benefit. Now, I guess I can go into that in a different video because that's kind of outside of the scope of the video uh, currently. Um, now, I want you to take a second and look at this position and just talk about some of the factors. You know, maybe look at material. Okay, everything's equal except for uh, this pawn here. White has an extra pawn. Uh, you know, both kings are castled. Uh, and I want you to see if there's anything else going on in this position. Um, and I'm going to go through, and maybe soon I'll point it out and it'll become obvious to you. But, but just, just think about one key factor. Uh, and again, the the idea for this video is tact about tactical vulnerabilities, right? Uh, so, black played rookie six, and this is a mistake. Um, of course, tactical vulnerabilities, there's a simple tactic here, which uh, goes a little bit deeper than the tactic itself, right? So, excuse me. So, black has these two pieces, and usually you're able to, like, when... This happens a lot, and I, I should have showed you in the Pierce defense. Uh, maybe I could have recreated that. However, I'll just show you here. Uh, these two pieces are, you know able to be forked by simply playing d5, right? And typically that's, you know, a double attack, kind of similar to our last video. Uh, but you might start to think, like, well, hold on, only your rook is defending that pawn. You know, the bishop and the queen, they're both attacking the pawn, so aren't you just giving it away for free? And that's exactly what black thought is, you know. Bishop takes d5. And 
this is a critical blunder in the position uh, because of the one factor that uh, I wanted to talk about uh, that was the whole point of white playing all of this. The whole point of white playing d5 and using that tool, that isolated queen pawn, uh, in their position, that extra pawn. So you sacrifice the pawn and they play rook takes d5, attacking the queen. Now, if queen takes, what's the issue? Queen b8, uh, threatening uh, checkmate. Well, it is checkmate after the queen defends and rook defends. So, black plays queen c6, realizing that they can't capture. But then the game's all over. So, you have this stuff going on, right? And here, black resigned. And it all came about from understanding uh, that black had a weakness, they had back rank issues. White did not. You know, typically lifting a rook uh, is something that you want to take into consideration very deeply because if you don't have uh, that, they call it uh, making luft, having that space for your king to kind of get out just in case there are any checks on the back rank, you kind of want to be careful about lifting your rook, but, you know, White had all that taken care of. So they were able to do this, they were able to sacrifice the pawn because, again, the rook wanted the open file and they wouldn't attack the weak back rank of the king. And these are just small things to look forward to, uh, and or to look for, and you'll start to notice them when you, uh, you know, study more tactics and uh, things of that sort, and understanding tactical vulnerabilities and ideas that just, you know, come to life in a position when you just notice, and you look at a position for its qualitative and quantitative factors, and. I use those terms in hopes that you check out chess diagnostic series uh, on chess strategy. So, so this one was really nice. I thought it was uh, really beautiful myself. Uh, that's why I picked it up. And let's just go on to one more game. Uh, so let's see. So we have another Pierce defense. Uh, let's see. I think this is the classical variation. Play isn't entirely perfect. So, here's the position I want to look at. So, black attacks the e4, or excuse me, e5 pawn uh, once more. And, you know, white decides to defend. And this here, I kind of want to talk about. Uh, you know, the psychology of playing chess versus following principles again. Okay. Um, so, White's defending their pawn for the moment, sure. Uh, but I kind of want you to look at what's going on, right? Both sides are castled, right? Uh, so, what's Black's idea here? What's the plan? So, surely, you know, they're attacking this pawn twice. It's being defended twice, right? So, a lot of times, amateurs, and uh, of course, I'm an amateur myself, we all, you know, <laughs> unless you're, you know, a super grandmaster or someone, you know, playing chess all the time, uh, you can't really call yourself a uh, professional player. You can call yourself a chess professional, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But if you're an amateur, you know, you say, okay, this pawn's being attacked, this pawn's being defended, you know, what can I do? Okay. This bishop isn't doing anything. I need to I need to develop it, and that's exactly what happened. Bishop d7, uh, bishop d7, and you know they finished their development. They connected the rooks. You know you can clap and you know be proud of yourself. But when you think about it, what does bishop d7 do for the position, right? Your whole position focus uh, was here. So let's look more into other factors of the board because if you just think about you know, I got a complete development, you know, yay me, I'm doing well, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, you know, uh, in the chess opening, you know, I, you know, all my pieces are soon to be involved in the entire game. You're not really playing chess, you know, you have to take a look at the position and analyze it on a deeper level and uh, really understand the factors that are going on. So, I'm going to give a hint and 
This one's similar to our uh, first example. So we'll give you a second to look at the position. I'm sure you've been looking at it the entire time. So I want you to take a look at what's going on. Everything's castled. You know, white is going to want to develop their bishop, you know, uh, somewhere. And what can black do to kind of continue on their plan? You know, they attack this pawn twice. You know, maybe they can attack it a third time. And f6 then comes to mind. Um, wait. No, not f6, right? Yeah, f6. So why am I thinking about f6? Look at this file. What's going on here? These three pieces are all undefended, right? And, uh, you know, it's going to be really tough for once black captures here to, uh, you know, defend the pawn. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what white really does here. I think white uh, has a losing position. They may not exactly lose a piece, uh, but there's... Uh, a lot to be said about playing f6, you know, if they take, you know, you have these three pawn islands, which aren't typically good, but now you're attacking uh, everything. Now you just trade a pair of pawns, you know, uh, maybe something like this or, you know, uh, you know, just maybe white tries to hold on to the pawn excuse all the arrows here but it's just tough it's not uh it's not so easy for white to defend and it gives you a lot of things to look at and excuse my uh interruptions and my slower speech i'm just trying to look at the position a little bit further and uh see what's really going on uh let me toss on the engine for just a second yeah and it just re recommends uh uh, F takes E5, and let's go back a little bit. I kind of want to look at this. So, here. So they want white to play something like uh, something like Bishop C5, but they look at their pawn and say, "Oh, okay, it has to be defended," you know, and it can't really it can't really be defended. And it might be a little bit tough to see. Uh, But you see, now they're trying to find ways for white to get their pieces uh, protected because they know this file is being ripped open, this rook's taken over the file, and they're given, the engine's giving uh, minus one and a half for black, so about a point and a half advantage, and, you know, things are looking really good. And all this stems from just, you know, what's going on here, you know. Uh, Sure, this pawn's defended, but look at all these undefended pieces. How can I get to them? Easiest way to do that? F6. I just rip the position open, and these things will come to you uh, when you start to look for them, and when you start to understand what to look for. Uh, today I just to give a few examples, you know, undefended pieces, because that's huge in a lot of novice games. It's huge. Uh, you know, back rank, that's huge in a lot of novice games, uh, in our previous example. And you know, just taking these things into consideration and pausing for a second and saying, okay, instead of just developing, instead of just, you know, bishop d7 and, you know, patting yourself on the back, you know, understanding that there's more in the position, but what is there, you know? So you don't just look at what you have to do. You have to see what's going on in your opponent's camp. And, you know, f6 is, you know, a great move. It just rips open the position. Um... And before I keep talking in circles, I just want to say that, you know, this is what makes chess fun. You know, just creating imbalances un and analyzing a position for what it really is. And uh, calculating, you know, you know, studying a position. And that's why I'll always make the argument for playing longer time controls. 
whether it's at the top level or, uh, you know, on your weekend quads or tournaments or any over the board events, because it's just, you know, it gives you the chance to consider all of these variations, you know, because you can simply say Bishop D7 and, you know, EM develop, what am I doing? And that's a question you need to ask yourself, you know, they always say develop, 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 but developing with a plan is just, you know, so much better and more important. And if Bishop D7 doesn't contribute to your overall idea, then, you know, why play it? You know, look for something else that's going on in position. You know, this continues the initiative. It gives Black the ability to keep making threats. Why can't just, you know, develop their bishop and be happy? You know, they have to attend to, you know, all this tension that's going on here. And there's lots of it. And it just makes the game, I hate to be the dead horse, but it just makes the game more exciting. And... You know, so study those tactics trainers, look at the uh, playlist by, uh, or the video series by Chess Diagnostic, and, you know, really see if, you know, there's something that you can pick up on and focus on for your next few games. And uh, a lot of it, and the reason I did these tactical vulnerabilities, the undefended pieces, uh, is because you'll see it a lot in your games, and they can really dictate whether you're playing passively and mindlessly. Or you're being creative and you're really playing chess. Um, yeah, and that's all for me. Um, I'm going to cut this video uh, because I feel like I've been rambling for quite a bit. Um, but that's that again. That's that's all for me. I hope you guys have learned something uh, new or something valuable. And until next time, be well, my friends.